Today we're looking at network time protocol and uh, this is how you synchronize a couple of computers, well, well, in fact the whole world, uh, potentially. I got into this um, sort of by accident. I met Dave Mills, who is the godfather or something of NTP. He did all the early work on it and I think he's still involved. So I happened to meet him at a conference and uh, he, he was telling me a few anecdotes about it. And so when I got back home, I thought, all oh, right, I have to have a play with this. Because at the time we only had a few computers slightly networked and it didn't really matter too much whether they were running at the same time. Everybody, you know, just look at your wristwatch, type in the time, that's, that's good enough. Uh, but there are some applications where you really need the time to be uh, a lot closer, particularly when you share file systems. So if one computer writes a file and puts a timestamp on it and the other one looks at it, it's not too bad if this one is behind that one, but if it's ahead of it, the, this, this computer gets a bit confused and says, well, th this time hasn't happened. Uh, you know, and so, some will make crazy decisions based on that, uh, particularly with the, the Make program that... Uh, looks at timestamps a lot. So uh, Dave Mills came up with this um, process to synchronize computers. And I sort of, I remember chatting with him and thinking, that's an interesting problem. How do you synchronize? Because if, if you go and talk to that computer and say, what time have you got? And it comes across and it says, you know, the time is 10.32 and 57 seconds or something like that. You think, well, is that now or how long has it taken to get from here to there? If I do it again, it may well be different because it may come over quicker or it may come over slower. So um, anyway, that's, that's kind of where we got started with this. And uh, so I had a beer with him or something. I, I forget, it was a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I thought it'd be interesting to just to, to show how this, this all works. So it's all based on an NTP packet. So there's a, this is, 32 bits I think across here. So there's a whole lot of little flags and bits uh, which you often get in protocols in, in the very first byte that tell you. I think this is the version and this this one actually tells you whether there's a leap second happening today because uh, it even caters for that. And there's a stratum here and I think that's the version. I forgot what goes in there but uh, it's, it's not quite so important. Then there's some other stuff but the key bit are some timestamps that come in. So there's a T0 T1, T2, and there's also a T3, but that doesn't actually appear in it. And then there's some other stuff down here, which is to do with authentication and authorization. So if you need to make sure that you're not uh, getting bogus packets from places. So this didn't used to be in the first version because everybody trusted everybody back in the, uh, back in the day. But uh, since then, everybody's got much more um, uh, focused on security. So, what you do to synchronize clocks is we have a client on the server and uh, the client wants to synchronize to the server. So it sends out a packet with its T0, which is, uh, this is my time. This is what I think my time is. And as soon as it arrives into the server, it stamps it with T1, that's the service time. So this would then, T1 minus T0 is, is how long it took to, to get across there. That would be if the clocks were right, yes, yeah, yeah, but, but uh, at this point they're not right, uh, we're almost always the case. Okay. So then it does some processing internally because it, it might be handling lots of things and then eventually it's going to send back a packet and it will put T2 in, which is my time when I've actually sent this out. And when it comes back in, you do record when it comes back in T3. And you don't need to fill it into the, uh, the protocol packet because um, you, you're finished with that. So you can see probably that these two times are on the same machine, so they are relatively the same. You know, if you subtract T3 minus T0, then that's how long this whole thing has taken. But you can improve that by also um, removing the T2 minus T1, because that's how long it took to, to process that. This gives you a fairly good estimate of the round trip minus the server's processing. Uh, and then the, uh, the difference in clocks is uh, T1 minus T0. You know, this is the server's clock and my clock. And you know, if that, that equals zero, then they're synchronized. Uh, it, it never does, but uh, you want to get closer and closer to that. So if it's... Uh, I guess if it's negative, it's one way, and if it's positive, it's the other way. You then have to adjust your clock and say, oh, we're out by three or four seconds. So that's usually where you, you plug
by this clock skew algorithm to say, right, keep, uh, we're, we're a bit ahead, so keep uh, taking, instead of every second moving on a second, we'll move on you know, 0.99 of a second, and eventually we'll get closer and closer to the real thing. Uh, there's actually now a system call to do that, so that uh, in certain Unixes anyway. I believe Windows has something similar. So that you don't get these huge jumps in time, that uh, time moves slowly and imperceptibly onwards. But to get it even better, you do this a number of times, and you also do it to a number of uh, servers, if you can, so you get a sense of um, different times from different servers, and they should all be fairly close if they're all uh, sort of playing the game. But some of them you will get much better uh, round trip times. Uh, but more importantly, some of them you will get a very stable round trip time, so it doesn't vary. You know, if, you, if one takes a second and then the next one is five seconds, you, you never quite know where you are. So it has within the, uh, the protocol, the, the, the protocol state machine, a way to work out which is the best and say, well, this, this one is a very good source of time, but it's, um, it's moving around too much. So I'm, I'm not going to trust that. Uh, the communication links are just too bad. It's perhaps in South America or somewhere like that. Uh, but this one is not quite as good, but uh, at least it's stable. And this is where the stratum comes in, this ST. So you can have 16 stratums, I think. What does stratum mean then? So a zero stratum is a, is a really good clock. So it's like an atomic clock or a GPS clock or something like that. And a stratum one is a computer that's using one of those to synchronize itself. So you never actually talk to a stratum zero. And a stratum two is something that's synchronized to a stratum one and a stratum three to... So it's kind of hops on. away from the from, ultimate from the, sources. Yeah. So that all sort of feeds into it. It would prefer to synchronize to a stratum one because you're closer to it, but this jitter and the fact that um, quite a lot of the stratum one clocks are kind of a bit locked down and don't trust anyone because otherwise everybody would synchronize to that. So you, you go backwards and forwards uh, between them. How often is this happening? Uh, well, it happens quite quickly initially. I think it's every minute. Uh, but once it's settled down and decide where it is, it, it slowly backs off until it's about every 10 minutes it sends a packet out and says, um, are you still right? Because by now it's synchronised it. But Nottingham, originally we had connections across the internet to just one place that had one of these stratum one or two things, so we were setting it from that. And then we were distributing it all around the department because we only had a very thin wire at that point, which was great because you... So you'd see the stratum 1 come in and we would all be stratum 2 because we were connected to that. But when you lose that connection, it, it's quite interesting what happens. So each of the computers looks around and says, oh, I've lost that one, but there's a whole load of stratum 2s around here, so I'll synchronise to one of those. And they're all saying, oh, yes, there's a, I lost that, but there's a whole load of stratum 2s. So I'll synchronise to that, so that makes me a 3. And this one says, oh, that was a 2 a minute ago. It's now a 3, so I'm now a 4. And this one says, well, that... That's a four now, so I'm a five. So they, they move up until they get to 16, and then they sort of, uh, they, they kind of tap out at that point and say, oh yeah, there doesn't seem to be anything, uh, anything reliable anymore. So uh, that, that, that's kind of where, where they give up on that. And how accurate can it be? It can get very, very accurate. You can certainly get to milliseconds or, or even better now, I think. I think the protocol has it down to microseconds. One of the things in my late night conversation with Dave Mills is he spent half his life I think watching clocks and seeing how they drifted. So when uh, the UK first came online and uh, started synchronising he was watching uh, some of the early traffic across that and he noticed at sort of five o'clock all the clocks started to drift and then they sort of got back into sync at about seven o'clock only by small amounts and uh, this was because you know that is when everybody gets thrown from work, puts the kettle on, the power grid suits up, and the 50 hertz signal slowly moves slightly as they try and maintain the grid level. But that influences the clocks. So the clocks all sort of drift, and then when the load diminishes, they, they put it up a bit, so all the clocks move back a bit. But he said, I can tell, you know, I can tell when Coronation Street's on, and I can tell when the, uh, the uh, adverts are on, because I can see, see this gap here. So for, for those not in the UK, these are kind of like popular soap operas, soap operas on the yeah, television. With a break halfway through that everybody rushed out, put the kettle on to have a cup of tea, you know, being British. So he could detect that. He reckoned um, 
in one case there was an earthquake in um, San Francisco, I think, uh, and he said, the clocks went a bit spooky beforehand. I could see them drifting around. I wonder if I've got an earthquake detection device. I don't think he ever followed that up. But uh, th there's a few cases like that where he said, you know, I could see strange things happening because I got this high level of precision. Fun for robotics and for problem solving, which is your, by choosing the car, 10% of your journeys take you 71 Four minutes. dice. Die A, B, C and D. And I tell you that die A has a value 4. How much did you learn about the data set? 